Okay, I'm going to tell you today about inductors. And inductors are important elements in things like filters, electronic filters, resonators, and uh, elements for power electronics like motors and generators and power transmission systems. And inductors are drawn just as these little squig squiggly lines that are reminiscent of a solenoid because fundamentally that's what an inductor is, is a winding of wires. So it has L which is inductance which is measured in Henry's and it has a store a parameter that it stores inside it just like a capacitor stores charge an inductor stores flux and flux is basically a magnetic field contained within an area so if these represent lines of magnetic field going into the page then we select an area and the flux is the integral of the magnetic field over that area so you can make flux larger by either increasing the current that's generating the magnetic field or you can make flux larger by increasing the area which is proportional to the inductance. So that's frequently represented as either the area of the solenoid, but also the number of turns of the solenoid effectively increases the area. So if you remember um, the units of flux from your physics classes, it's Weber's, uh, which is equivalent to volts times seconds. So the voltage comes into play here as the time derivative of the flux. And that means that if we differentiate this expression, IL, we take this into the flux here and we differentiate it, then we get from the chain rule L DIL DT plus, of course, I, uh, IL times DL DT. But naturally, this flux, this inductance, isn't likely to change in time. So this term is usually 0. And we're left with just VL is equal to L DIL DT, which is called the constitutive relation of, of the inductor. Just like for Ohm's law, V equals IR was the constitutive relation. And for a capacitor, I equals CDV DT is the constitutive relation for an uh, inductor L equals uh, V equals LDI DT is the constitutive relation. So if we invert this relation, we can write the current as the integral of the voltage that's been applied to it. Now I want to be a little bit careful here make sure I specify the variables in time. So IL at a time T is going to equal the integral from minus infinity to that time T of the inductance over all previous times. Let's call those T prime. So that's the integration variable. And if we draw it, here is VL. Uh, here is our T prime axis. And here is the voltage varying in T prime. And what you see is if you want to know the voltage at time, sorry, if you want to know the current at time, whoops, I wrote that in pen so I can't erase it, so just ignore that prime. If you want to know the voltage at all time in history, uh, you, if you want to know the current, sorry, at all time in history, you're going to integrate the voltage. So that's the area. So you can see the current is going to go up. Then the current is going to go down. Then the current is going to go up again. We integrate up all those changes, and the area under that is going to be the current. So this current represents stored flux in the inductor. And in order to store that flux, some work had to have been done, OK? Because there's energy stored in that magnetic field. So if we, if we calculate the energy stored, 
in the magnetic field, the easiest way to do that is to recognize, first of all, that the power is the rate of change of the energy. And if we invert that relation, we can say that the energy is the integral, the energy at time t is going to be the integral from minus infinity to the current time of that power. So imagine, if you will, at some time minus infinity, at the start of the universe, there was zero current in the inductor. And now we've taken it to the present time. Now we're in a state where there is some current stored in the inductor. And the question is, how much work was done in order to get us into that state? And that'll tell us how much energy is stored in the inductor. So if we integrate from minus infinity to the present time, the power, which is the current times the voltage, we should get it. Now we're stuck though, because we don't know how to do this integral, because uh, we're integrating IL, we don't know the dependence of IL on T prime, we don't know the dependence of VL on T prime, and so you would think we have a real big problem. We do know this constitutive relation over here though, right? This thing is a pretty significant fact about inductors, and so we can use that. And all of a sudden, if we do that, things look a lot better because we have this L DIL DT prime. And it looks like the DT primes cancel. Now you can't quite do that without worrying about the limits of the integration because they're expressed right now in terms of time. But if we re-express these limits in terms of a current, so we take the current at minus infinity, which was zero, and we take the current now, which is I naught, uh, then we can cancel the dt primes and end up with an integral in terms of DIL. So, this integral is easy to do, it's just IL squared over 2. Evaluate it from 0 to I naught, which is going to be just 1 half L times the present current squared. So that 1 half L I squared is the fundamental energy relation for the energy stored in the inductor. That's an important thing to know about inductors. That'll come up when we talk about LC circuits and, and things like that, decay of energy. Um, also, don't forget the constitutive relation. That's something that's worth committing to memory, as well as this, this IL. And this IL, I'll mention, has a special name. It's called the state variable, because it tells you what state the inductor is in. So I think the key things to remember is this notion of flux, this constitutive relation, the state variable, and the energy stored in an inductor.